This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 106. Coming up on Space Time, discovery of an unknown stellar population at the galactic center, Sweden to stop assisting China's space program, and that air leak on the International Space Station, well, it's still there. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have found an unknown population of stars at the very centre of the Milky Way galaxy. The unexpected discovery was made in the Nuclear Star Cluster, one of the richest stellar regions in the known universe. This population stood out because its composition is very different from other stars in this super-dense region of space. The question now is where did they come from and how did they get there? The centre of the Milky Way galaxy, some 27,000 light-years from Earth, is home to more closely packed stars than anywhere else in the galaxy, all of them orbiting around a supermassive black hole, some 4.3 million times the mass of the Sun, called Sagittarius A star. Astronomers estimate this innermost region of our galaxy contains more than 20 million stars, crammed into an area of just 26 light-years. This should be the brightest part of our night sky but it's barely visible, hidden behind a thick veil of gas and dust which shrouds the galactic centre. You can't see through it with visible light, but astronomers can peer through this barrier using infrared telescopes, which focus on longer wave heat signatures rather than optical light. These new observations show the nuclear star cluster to be far more massive than other regions of the galaxy. But the Milky Way is by no means unique, and astronomers believe that most spiral galaxies contain not just a central supermassive black hole, but also a nuclear star cluster. But the nuclear star cluster in the Milky Way is the only place where astronomers can resolve individual stars because of its relative closeness. And that makes it an ideal laboratory for studying the properties of these huge stellar clusters. So, astronomers use the Very Large Telescope, the VLT, located in Chile, to study this unique region, analysing a group of around 700 stars in order to determine their brightness, their surface temperatures, their chemical compositions and their orbits. Now, the chemical composition of a star, especially what's called metallicity, that is the abundance of elements heavier than hydrogen and helium, the two elements created in the Big Bang, is an important characteristic because it tells astronomers about a star's history and age. A star with high metallicity, that is one containing a large number of heavy elements such as oxygen, carbon and iron, indicates it must have formed out of the remains of earlier precursor stars and therefore is relatively young. On the other hand, low metallicity indicates a very old star, one which formed in the early universe when there were fewer heavy elements around. Now, the majority of stars in the central region of the Milky Way galaxy have higher metallicities than the Sun, meaning they were formed more recently. However, Astronomers found that about 7% of the stars they were observing in the nuclear star cluster were different, with far lower metallicity. In other words, they were far more ancient and formed far earlier in the galaxy's history. The authors also found that these stars were moving at a higher velocity than the surrounding stars, and their direction of motion was slightly tilted in relation to the galactic plane. The properties of these unusual stars all seem to be surprisingly similar, and that suggests a common origin – an origin different from other stars in the region. Astronomers believe that nuclear star clusters are at least partly formed through the collisions of earlier star clusters, spatially denser collections of stars of similar ages within a galaxy. Held together by their mutual gravitational pull, they move jointly through surrounding field stars. Star clusters exist in all known galaxies. And due to a phenomenon known as dynamic friction, in other words, the gravitational effect of surrounding matter, clusters can lose speed as they orbit and thus drift towards the galactic center. At this point, they merge with other star clusters, forming much larger nuclear star clusters. Now, it's possible that this newly discovered population is a remnant from a specific older group of stars. So, the authors used computer simulations to try and test this hypothesis, finding that as stellar clusters fall towards the galactic center, gravitational interactions cause the stars to be ejected from their original clusters. 
And once a cluster reaches the innermost part of the galaxy, it ends up being dissolved within a relatively short period of time, as its stars become largely indistinguishable from the rest of the stars in the area. Now, since the members of this newly discovered stellar population still have some very specific characteristic similarities despite their dispersal, astronomers suspect a common origin for these stars outside the nuclear star cluster. So, they then re-ran their simulations using different parameters, finding that these stars must have entered the central area within the last 3 to 5 billion years. So the stars either originated further out of the Milky Way and then gradually migrated inwards, or alternatively they were part of another galaxy that's been cannibalized and consumed by the Milky Way. The authors also compared the observed properties of the newly discovered stellar population with properties of older globular clusters in the Milky Way, those out in the halo of the galaxy, as well as those that entered the Milky Way when being merged with other galaxies they found that their properties best match those of older globular clusters in the Milky Way itself. This is space time. Still to come, Stockholm announces that Sweden will cease providing satellite ground station services for China, and a new Spanish Earth observation satellite prepares for launch. All that and more still to come on space time. Okay, let's take a break from our show for a word from our sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus is a brilliant streaming service with an extensive library. You can educate yourself on almost any topic imaginable, explore distant exoplanets, understand world history. You can even improve your cooking skills or learn how to play a musical instrument. Importantly, all of the content is objective and fact-based, something that's becoming increasingly important in today's world, and it's all presented by top professors and experts in their fields. And with the Great Courses Plus app, it's easy to access anytime, anywhere. This week, I've been checking out a new course on the Great Courses Plus called How Science Shapes Science Fiction. And what I've found is that the best science fiction is indeed based in really great science. From the physics of spaceflight to the creation of alien languages, this course lets you uncover the way real-world science is applied by the great names of science fiction, such as Jules Verne, Isaac Asimov and Stanley Kubrick. As they say, unearth the science behind the fiction. It's a fascinating course, one you can check out for yourself and do it for free. And as a space-time listener, when you sign up to The Great Courses Plus, you get to check out any course or lecture for free. That's a free access trial to their entire library. Sign up today using our special URL. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. Thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. And of course, we'll put those URL details in the show notes and on our website. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. And now it's back to our show. You're listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Stockholm has announced that Sweden will cease providing satellite ground station services to China or accept new Chinese space business because of changes in what it euphemistically calls the global political landscape. The move by Sweden comes as Beijing continues to alienate a growing number of nations around the world. There are concerns over Beijing's territorial claims over the South China Sea, its imposition of new laws on Hong Kong in violation of the Two Chinas Agreement, the cover-up of the lethality and spread of the coronavirus, the imposition of trade sanctions against Australia over Canberra's call for a global investigation into the COVID-19 pandemic, continued cyber security breaches, including the hacking of classified and patented commercial materials, and the treatment of China's minority communities, including the Uyghurs. Then there are concerns over forced organ harvesting, the treatment of Taiwan, the annexation of Tibet, and the crushing of the Falun Gong. Stockholm's decision means Beijing will soon lose its ability to communicate with its spacecraft by way of the Swedish Space Corporation's ground stations in Sweden and Chile, as well as the Dongress satellite station 350 kilometres north of Perth, where Sweden operates S, X and KU band dishes. The Dongra facility was built by the Swedish Space Corporation and then leased to Beijing, with key components shipped from China after Australian authorities approved the deal. The loss of Dongra will limit Beijing's ability to precisely position spacecraft to enhance its ability to accurately locate naval targets. The Dongra station was one of five used by Beijing outside China. 
As well as the other Swedish station in Chile, China's also using tracking ground stations in Pakistan, Kenya and Namibia. Meanwhile, in a bid to counter Sweden's move, Beijing's already re-established diplomatic ties with the small Central Pacific Island nation of Kiribati, where it has an old mothballed ground station. These renewed diplomatic ties with the island nation include signing the nation up to Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative, which provides finance for high-risk projects banks won't touch in return for Chinese government political influence or control of local infrastructure if these projects go sour. This is Space Time. Still to come, a new Spanish Earth Observation satellite arrives in Karoo ready for launch. And remember that leak aboard the International Space Station? Well, it's still there. All that and more still to come on Space Time. After leaving the Airbus factory in Madrid on the 24th of September, the Spanish high-resolution land imaging mission, Soyosat Ingenio, has arrived safely at the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana. There it will undergo final preparations for launch later this year. Packed safely within a protective container, Soyosat was transported together with its co-passenger, the French Space Agency's Tyrannus satellite, both of which are slated to launch on a Vega rocket in November. The 750kg Seosat will be placed into a 670km high sun-synchronous orbit. Seosat, which stands for Spanish Earth Observation Satellite, carries state-of-the-art dual cameras that have the ability to image Earth's landmass with a resolution down to 2.5 metres. It will provide data for cartography, land use, urban development and water management, as well as helping out during natural disasters such as floods, wildfires and earthquakes. This report from ESA TV. In an Airbus cleanroom in Madrid, the Seosat Ingenio satellite is being prepared for shipment to Europe's spaceport in Kourou, French Guiana. By the end of 2020, this brand new Earth observation satellite will be launched into orbit on a Vega rocket. Seosat stands for Spanish Earth Observation Satellite, and Ingenio is Spanish for Ingenuity. It's a Spanish national satellite mission funded by CDTI, the Spanish Center for the Development of Industrial Technology, developed by the European Space Agency in collaboration with Spanish industry. The mandate of CDTI uh, is uh, promoting uh, the innovation and uh, technological development of Spanish companies. Uh, we belong uh, to the Ministry of uh, Science and, and Innovation, and uh, we have a special mission try to convert uh, technological and uh, scientific uh, knowledge into uh, competitive and sustainable growth uh, in, in Spain. Seosat Ingenio is an optical Earth observation satellite which will provide high-resolution images of Earth's land cover with a primary focus on Europe and in particular Spain, North Africa and South America. Seosat Ingenio carries a state-of-the-art dual camera that can image Earth's land with a resolution of 2.5 metres. It will capture images in the panchromatic band, meaning black and white, as well as in four multispectral bands, red, blue, green and near-infrared, at a resolution of 10 metres. The satellite will be covering swathes of land 55 kilometres wide and also has the capability to look sideways, enabling it to access any point on Earth within three days a challenging mission for engineers to develop. Optical payloads are uh, very challenging in terms of alignment and stability of uh, their elements. The mirrors and the optical elements of SEOSAT have to be aligned with extremely high precision, equivalent to some one-tenth of the diameter of uh, human hair, and uh, have to be very stable in spite of the very high vibration experienced by the satellite during launch and during the extremely uh, large temperature variation in orbit. The final tests performed with uh, the satellite has proved Proven that uh, the payload and the satellite comply with uh, this requirement and maintain very well their performance. 
Seosat Ingenio is aimed at civilian, institutional and government users and will provide information for a wide variety of applications. These include disciplines such as cartography, agriculture, forestry, urban development and water management. The data will also be used to help map natural disasters such as floods, wildfires and earthquakes, as well as provide information on one of humankind's biggest challenges, climate change. The SEOSAT mission has been developed as part of the Spanish Earth Observation Programme, which is based on two complementary satellites, Ingenio and Paz, which is a radar mission. But its scope goes beyond the national level. SEOSAT Ingenio perfectly fits into the European landscape of satellite missions that are existing or planned in the near future. For example, we have the Copernicus program with the Sentinels, which are uh, delivering data for free and open to everyone, but at a lower resolution. SEOSAT uh, Ingenio provides higher resolution at 2.5 meters in the panchromatic uh, channel uh, and therefore complements the Copernicus data but also is a commercial satellite where these data will be offered on the commercial market. So it is a commercial enterprise as much as a societal enterprise because the information that is required is of value to Europe, uh, is of value to Spain and is therefore also uh, filling a market segment that today is a very important one. Today, high-resolution images of Earth are deemed an essential commodity for a wide range of scientific, commercial and governmental applications. With the development and launch of SEOSAT Ingenio, ESA and Spain are answering these needs. Once again, ESA and Europe are proving that they are at the forefront of Earth observation technology, providing the data needed to monitor our planet while servicing and protecting the people living on it. The Russian Federal Space Agency Roscosmos says cosmonauts have now narrowed down the location of an airlick aboard the International Space Station to somewhere in the Russian Zvezda service module. The Zvezda, or star module, contains mostly scientific equipment. Mission managers first detected the leak in September last year, but it was so small back then, other than monitoring it, they didn't worry too much. However, things changed in August when the amount of atmosphere escaping into space began increasing. Last month, the crew thought they narrowed down the location of the leak to an American segment of the space station. But isolation tests showed that wasn't the case, and the hut has now narrowed it down to somewhere in the Zvezda module. Roscosmos says the situation isn't dangerous for the crew, but it is above the normal level of air loss caused by the station's air purification system. This latest leak follows another one back in 2018 when the crew found a hole in the hull of a Russian Soyuz capsule docked to the orbiting outpost. It's believed that hole was caused accidentally during the manufacture of the spacecraft and then badly patched up to try and hide the error. Now, while we're on the subject of the space station, the crew aboard the ISS have again been forced to carry out an emergency avoidance manoeuvre in order to ensure they're not hit by another piece of space junk. Russian and American mission managers undertook the two-and-a-half-minute operation to adjust the space station's orbit and allow the debris to pass by some 1.4 kilometres clear of the space station, travelling at 28,000 kilometres per hour. The three crew members were forced to relocate to a so-called safe haven near their Soyuz spacecraft as the manoeuvre began, so they could evacuate if necessary. The debris was part of a 2018 Japanese rocket that mysteriously exploded into 77 different pieces last year. Emergency avoidance manoeuvres are becoming more frequent, with this latest event being the 25th and the 3rd this year. And the problem's expected to get much worse, as Earth's orbit becomes littered with more and more spacecraft, disused satellites, spent rocket stages and bits and pieces of space junk, ranging from tools lost by astronauts to clouds of debris caused by deliberate anti-satellite missile tests by the Indians and Chinese. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. 
A new study has shown that folate, magnesium and dairy products may help to stave off bowel cancer. The findings reported in the journal GART are based on data from 80 studies, which also found that a high-fibre diet rich in fruit and vegetables can also help reduce the risk, and that aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are also probably protective. However, the authors of this study found no evidence that garlic, onions, tea, fish or coffee provided any protection against the disease. They also found that eating too much red or processed meats and drinking alcohol, even at modest levels, were linked to an increased risk of bowel cancer. A new review suggests that up to 30% of positive COVID-19 cases could go through their infection without ever showing symptoms. The findings reported in the journal PLOS Medicine are based on 79 studies which show that roughly 20% of cases were asymptomatic, but the authors say there were biases in some studies which limited their certainty. Seven studies specifically screened for and then followed up with positive COVID-19 cases. And the results from these studies suggest that the proportion of asymptomatic cases could be as high as 31%. The review also found some evidence that the virus is more likely to spread by people if they have symptoms. But the authors cautioned that preventative measures such as hand hygiene, wearing masks, testing and tracing, isolation strategies and social distancing are all still needed. Meanwhile, a separate study reported in the journal Thorax has found that people with asymptomatic COVID-19 infection still have as much viral load in their nose and throats as people who have symptoms. More than a million people have now died and over 34 million have been infected by the COVID-19 coronavirus since it first spread out of its origins in Wuhan, China. A new study says there's now no doubt that Spinosaurus, the largest carnivorous dinosaur that ever lived, was a river monster, probably living a life very similar to modern-day crocodiles. Spinosaurus reached lengths of 18 metres, that's almost 60 feet, and it weighed an estimated 23 tonnes. Now, by comparison, its far more famous land-loving relative, Tyrannosaurus rex, reached a bit over 12 metres or 40 feet in length, with a maximum weight of around 15 tonnes. The new findings, reported in the journal Cretaceous Research, are based on the discovery of more than a thousand dinosaur teeth from the prehistoric Kemkem River system, which flowed through the Sahara Desert 100 million years ago in what is now Morocco. Until recently, paleontologists believed that dinosaurs lived exclusively on land. However, the discovery earlier this year that Spinosaurus had an oar-like tail, one adapted for an aquatic lifestyle, began to raise questions. Now, the discovery of some 1,200 Spinosaur teeth in the same rock layer of an ancient riverbed further supports this theory because an animal living much of its life in water is more likely to contribute to the teeth in the river deposit compared to those who are only visiting the river for the occasional drink and to feed along its banks. Archaeologists have identified the earliest known human footprints in Saudi Arabia. The 115,000-year-old tracks reported in the journal Science Advances were left on an ancient freshwater lake in the Arabian Peninsula. The footprints were discovered in the southwestern part of the Nafud Desert and were left by hominids using the area as a place to drink and forage. While our current Homo sapien lineage left Africa about 60 to 70,000 years ago, several earlier excursions, including this one, were made by either earlier Homo sapiens or by some of their really close relatives. The story of human migration out of Africa shows evidence of early human migration more than 180,000 years ago in what is now Israel and also in Asia. But until now, there was no evidence of what happened in the area in between, what is now Arabia. A new study has found that young males are more likely to believe in COVID-19 myths. Researchers from the University of Sydney found that those aged between 18 and 25 were more likely to believe in fake news on COVID-19. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says the study shows that it's Kevins rather than Karens that are the stereotype du jour. This was an interesting survey done um, not that long ago, but they surveyed a few thousand sort of uh, people basically over 18 and they reckon they had a good distribution of different ages and different you know, attitudes, if you like. They found that, that people with a low understanding of health, they have a low health 
literacy had greater fear and greater misunderstanding. And that sort of makes sense. It's the same applies to everything, actually. When you've got more information, more knowledge about something, you tend to understand it better. That was significant and also amongst people with whose first language wasn't English, which also is pretty typical that if all the information is in English, they don't understand it. Therefore, they have greater fear. The young people, the young men, it's a sense of bravado. It's basically asking how many people do you think will have the disease? Do you, will you get it? If your friends get it, does it change your behavior? That sort of thing. And it tended to be that younger men, surprise, surprise, were more had more bravado. Do you just... remember when you were young? No, it's too far back, too mate. Too far back for you. <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, you tend to do things. We used to do some really stupid things as kids, especially where I grew up. I cringe to think of what we used yeah. to, to do. Yeah. Uh, is there a particular age group or, or demographic group that seems to stand out? There are certainly sort of indications about the, the young people and the young men, but it, it tends to be, as I say, people with uh, without uh, a high level of health literacy who don't understand all the issues. So there's a mixture of those people who think it's not going to affect me, young people's bravado, men's bravado, if you like, of uh, saying it's, it's, I can do whatever I like to do so I can go down to the pub and that sort of thing. So they have... Uh, not so much less fear, they just ignore it. The people who don't have strong English language skills tend to have more fear because they don't understand it. They don't see all the implications. So it's a mixture of how well you understand health and health issues, how young you are and how sort of basically uh, foolhardy you are and those who just don't understand because they don't have the language skills. So it's a mixture of those things. If I presume if you get a young man who doesn't understand about health and doesn't speak English, you've probably got the worst case of someone who just doesn't pay attention to any of the restrictions and regulations. And that's different to what you guys were thinking, isn't it? You guys thought it would be, well, for want of a better term, the Karens of this world. Yeah, it tends to be more Kevins than Karens, actually, as the expression is going. Um, that, that, Yeah, I mean, so with the image of the person who, who knows a lot about health because they read it on Google, on the internet, on social media, etc., is, is this woman they've nicknamed Karen, which is a bit rough on everyone named Karen. But actually, it's just as or more prevalent amongst young men. But young men tend to do it in their own social circles. This was looking at social media and a survey done on social media but women tend to be more overt in the public about complaining and the men tend to do it in their own groups. That's Tim Mindham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 